Thank you very much. I'm now more ambiguously happy about the recent decision. <laughs> it's always exciting when something in Python becomes so big, so exciting, has so many people behind it, that it winds up spinning off its own series of conferences uh, or events. Some of those are uh, remain general to the whole programming language, like the Pi Ladies, but others of them, like the Django series of conferences, become focused on a single tool. There are workplaces where they don't quite get that you're a Python programmer. You're the person who writes Django. You're the person who writes the website in Django. And on the one hand, when a new series of conferences spins up, that sometimes means we see some of those people less often. They're now busy and financially uh, committing to other conferences and don't always make it back to PyCon as often, so it can be a sort of wistful event as a part of the community uh, is seen less often. But it's a huge opportunity because of all of the people that then can show up at those conferences who we might never see here at PyCon. There are people that can't afford to send themselves to conferences whose workplaces wouldn't understand why they want to come to a conference with a schedule like ours with so many different topics. But if you show them a conference where everything is Django, 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 that's the thing we wrote our website in. We'll pay for you to go to that conference. And so many people that aren't, uh, the investment isn't in something abstract, Python the programming language, but in some one concrete application, get the opportunity by the dozens, by the hundreds, to attend conferences that they wouldn't otherwise get the chance to. Uh, notable examples uh, are the DjangoCon series of conferences now around the world, the PyData conferences that NumFocus runs now by the dozen a year, uh, which attract many people who, uh, again, the PyCon schedule would be too diluted uh, of the things they're interested in to make it worth it, but a day or two of all data all the time, and they're there. Uh, the SciPy conferences and the other worldwide academic conferences centered around uh, Python. Back before all of those, there was something called Plone. There was, uh, before that, uh, it was built a top uh, framework called Zope. And those of you who've been in the, the uh, Python world a long time, remember those groups spinning up as some of the very first events worldwide that still today go on worldwide. Focus not on Python, the language, but on one particular application that becomes so big and gets so much momentum that it becomes a whole parallel community to ours. For two days, you got the chance to see and talk to them in the expo hall, and now we'll get to hear from one of the longtime uh, developers and workers in the Plone community. Please welcome to our stage, Chris Ewing. So good morning. I'm here today to tell you a story about adaptation. And this story is going to be both metaphorical and also very literal. The story is, as Brandon pointed out, about Plone, which is an open source content management system, but also a community that I've been involved with for the last 10 years. Now, there's a couple of possible meanings for the word adaptation. But during the talk here, I'm going to be thinking about it in the biological or the evolutionary sense. I'll be thinking about the environmental challenges that Plone has faced, and then a number of different ways in which the idea of adaptation has served Plone well over the time that we've been active. We'll start with something that I'm going to call pseudo-adaptation. The idea here is that a behavioral change can mimic an evolutionary adaptation. It is an adaptation, but not in a true sense. For example, consider this athlete here. Her prostheses enable her ad adaptation to an environment that requires running. 
but the change isn't biological or evolutionary. We'll also look at an example that's similar to a concept called convergent adaptation, where different species undergo changes that make them similar to each other. For example, the flying squirrel and the uh, sugar glider. One of them is a placental mammal found here in North America. The other is a marsupial that's found in Australia. They come from very different branches of the evolutionary tree, and yet both of them have developed this adaptation that allows them to glide from treetop to treetop. Finally, we'll talk about some metaphorical adaptations. In these cases, there's no real adaptation happening, but the idea of adaptation is useful in thinking about how a system might work. Now, honestly, I have no reason to put a platypus up on the screen at the moment, except that it's a bit of an evolutionary oddball, and it kind of seems that you can't talk about object-oriented programming without getting down to the platypus. So we'll get to the technical stuff soon enough, but let's begin with a little bit of history. It'll help you to understand where Plone comes from and about the forces that have driven change in the system and in the community. We'll begin our story today by taking a trip way back in time. The year is 1996, and this man, who's the CTO of Digital Creations, a company in Fredericksburg, Virginia, is on a plane to the International Python Conference in California. He's scheduled to give a tutorial there about CGI programming, and so in the grand tradition of tutorials since the beginning of time, he spends the flight learning about the specification. <laughs> He's got some ideas about how to improve on it, and so on the flight home, he begins work on what would become Bobo, the world's first web object publishing system. Now, Bobo, along with Document Template, which was a package that supported dynamic templating, and BoboPause, uh, an object database that would later become the ZODB, form the core of what Digital Creations calls Principia. It's their commercial Python application server. In 1998, the largest investor in Digital Creations convinced the CEO, Paul Everett, to release the Principia software as open source. Principia became the Z object publishing environment, Digital Creations became the Zope Corporation, and Zope was born to the world. Now, Zope brought a number of technological innovations to the table, but the key ideas behind it were those of traversal and object publication. Traversal is a powerful idea, but it has a pretty simple origin, a URL. This part of the URL here is called the path. Notice how it looks an awful lot like a file system path. Now, back in 96, static web servers like Apache served static content by walking this file system, following the paths, and then returning the body of the object that they found as an HTTP response. CGI, which was the dominant dynamic web technology of the day, works in pretty much the same way, except that the object found at the end is actually an executable script. You run that script, it generates some headers and an HTTP body, and those are sent back to the client. Now, on that plane ride back in 96, Jim asked himself a question. Could we treat Python objects in the same way? If we had ourselves a database that could store arbitrary Python objects, and then we combine that with objects that could behave a little bit like Python dicts, in as much as they could contain other objects and then reference them by name, well, could we not then change this file system hierarchy into a series of nested object references? We could then treat the path segments like keys, and that would allow us to walk across a chain of contained objects just as if we were walking a file system. And since Zope is an object publishing environment, then the part that remains is to let objects publish themselves. We'd use this traversal process to look up the object. Then we would call the object and have it return a representation of itself. Finally, we'd take that representation and send it back to the requesting client as the response. Now, while Zope was powered by these ideas of traversal and object publication, there were a few other attributes that helped it to succeed. First off, security was baked directly into the objects of Zope, not added as an extra layer. This combined with object containment to allow for flexible and fine-grained access control across all levels of the system. And finally, using a persistent graph of Python objects made building sites with mixed content simple. But perhaps the most important idea within Zope was this thing about through the web development. Zope allowed new developers to build powerful applications using only their browser. This lowered the bar for getting started in web development. 
Enzo benefited greatly from this easy on-ramp, just like Python has benefited across the years from its own simplicity. And like Python, the system was plenty powerful, and it was secure enough to build really outstanding projects. Soon after its open source release in 1998, Zoop was being called Python's killer app, and numerous applications were being built on top of it. One of these was called the Portal Toolkit, or the Content Management Framework. We refer to this as the CMF. It was architected by a guy named Trace Seaver. The CMF provided all sorts of great tools for creating content, for controlling its publication, for setting its display using these page templates, for adding interactivity using form controllers and Python scripts that would take input from your users and then allow you to make decisions and take actions based on those inputs. And also, you could theme the resulting web application by picking up page templates, CSS, JavaScript, and so on from a series of ordered folders. But the CMF wasn't particularly nice to look at, especially for non-technical users. And so in 1999, two guys, Alex Leamy and Alan Runyon, met in the Zope IRC channel. Both were interested in improving the usability of the content management framework. And so they created CMF Plone as a theme package with the goal in mind of making it easier to use. They must have done a good job, because after its first public release in October of 2001, Plone quickly gained users and mind share. Its most distinguishing feature was the idea of in-place content creation. Users could navigate using their browser to the place in a website where they wanted a page to appear and then add it. Once the page had been created, they could simply click a button to edit it. They could control how it looked by selecting displays. They could allow access to different users at different levels simply by using a, a, a through the web tool here. And they could publish it. All of this right in the place where the content is located. There was no back end to learn, which made it easy for the average person to pick Plone up and build a website. Moreover, the strong security model that Plone inherited from Zope allowed websites to mix private and public content. This meant that organizations could combine what at the time tended to be separate intranet and extranet applications into a single seamless website, which reduced repetition and cost. Like Zope, Plone also benefited from this mix of being easy to pick up but powerful enough for serious work and attracted by the simplicity, the flexibility, the accessibility, and above all, by the unparalleled security, companies and schools, governments and nonprofits alike picked up Plone and began to use it, and the community grew quickly. A few months after the first release of Plone in early 2002, the Zope Corporation held the first ever community development sprint. The goal was to build internationalization support for Zope applications. But what the folks found was that participants in the sprint went home afterwards with an increased enthusiasm for working in the Zope ecosystem. The folks in Plone saw this happen, and they decided to follow suit, holding the first Plone sprint in Bern, Switzerland the next year, 2003. This began a long tradition of community-driven development, held in fantastic locations like Norwegian archipelagos, an alpine mountaintop, Italian villages, coastal beach houses, and even an Austrian castle. These sprints have served to move Plone forward and to keep the community vital. 2003 also saw the first annual Plone conference. The conference combined sprints with training and talks, a structure that we're all pretty familiar with. And it offered the community of Plonista as a way to keep abreast of the latest developments within the software world, to share knowledge with each other, to reconnect with each other, and to add new Plonistas to the community. It's a tradition that continues to this very day. There's no better place than the Plone Conference, which will be held in Boston this October, to learn about the exciting system that we're discussing here. So perhaps if you're interested in learning about the technologies that we talk about today, you might choose to join us there. Now, Plonistas combine frequent sprints and annual conferences with a wide open policy towards contributions and commitment to inclusion. And this has helped the community to grow strong. Over the years, more than 900 developers, designers, UI experts, and documentation writers have committed to the core of Plone. It's among the largest open source projects in the world. We, as Plonistas, appreciate very much the opportunity to come here and to share with you the pride and joy that we feel in using our system. And we hope that someday, if you have CMS needs, you'll choose to play with us. But what does this mean, CMS, a content management system? 
Let's be clear. At a basic level, a CMS should provide tools to create, edit, display, and delete content. More complex CMSs will offer you tools for interconnecting content, staging and versioning items, or maybe to aggregate things using tagging or other approaches. A truly powerful system will offer more translations, integrations with external systems, federated authentication. The options are nearly endless, so what you really want is a system that's going to be easily pluggable so that you can add the tools that you need when you need them. And how about that content that you're managing? A good CMS is going to provide content types out of the box, but it's pretty much impossible for them to anticipate every possible need. And so what you really want is a system that allows you to easily customize your content types as well. And hey, since it is your content that we're talking about, you probably want to be able to control how that looks. So a good CMS should easily support creating custom themes. In short, you want a system that's easily and inexpensively customizable. And having been built on top of Zope and the CMF, Plone provided this. You could even make changes directly through the web. But there were problems. They started, as weaknesses often do, right at the core of Plone's strength, which is this support for working through the web. The issue is, when you customize something through the web, your changes end up being stored entirely in the database. What this means is that you can't test them. You can't version them. And it's difficult to write documentation for the changes that you've made. And those site managers always mean to take these changes, move them out to the file system, and put them into version control. Life happens. Things get in the way. And this rarely actually happens. So if making untested, unversioned, and undocumented changes is going to cause you problems, then we should discourage or even prevent that behavior. So as Plone moved through version 2 and towards version 3, all the Plonistas were given new marching orders. We should be making all of our changes out on the file system, no more through the web development. Now, around this same time, there were tremendous advances being made in Python packaging. The creation of the Python package index between 2002 and 2003, and then the addition of setup tools enabled more flexible ways to distribute and install software. And the Zope and the Plone communities jumped right on board with using eggs for core and plug-in package installation. The benefits of these changes are quite clear. We get repeatable builds. We get reduced surprises, and we end up with modifications that are tested, versioned, and documented. But while the system remains very easy to use from the front end, in order to extend the system, now you have to be a Python programmer. To make matters a little bit worse, Plone was built on top of the CMF, which was built on top of Zope. And so, as one of the largest systems built in Zope, Zope is not particularly Pythonic. It had quirky method names and code style. PEP8 didn't come into Python until five years after Zope was begun. It had oddly redundant classes. The Python date time module arrived seven years after Zope. And perhaps most problematic, it made heavy use of multiple inheritance and mix-ins in order to share functionality across a widely customizable system. The end result meant that in order to have a hope of being able to customize Plone, you needed to be more than just a Python programmer. You had to be a Plone programmer. Plone was no longer quite so easily customizable, and a change was needed. But with hundreds of core contributors, directed change can be a little bit difficult. Now, we've seen that weakness can arise from apparent strength. But conversely, strength can also arise from apparent weakness. Plone's large and diverse community has tried out a number of different approaches to solving the problems that it's faced. Winners have arisen out of this evolutionary process. And Plone 5, which was released almost 14 years to the day after the first public release of the system, brings those winning adaptations to you. But don't just take my word for it. Let's take a look at some of the problems that Plone faced and the adaptations that have been made to solve them. We'll start with an adaptation that isn't exactly an adaptation. One of the highest barriers to entry in Plone development has always been the messy API. Plone provides access to core systems like registration, content creation and indexing, workflow, theming, and others through tool objects. Developers of these plugins could use the APIs of the tools to integrate their code with core functionality. The problem is that just getting hold of these tools requires you to possess a little bit of arcane knowledge. And beyond that, the APIs of the tools are not always clear. 
For example, let's say that you want to get some information about a user. Maybe you want their first name. Which of the four tools that are related to user management within Plone would you choose? <laughs> well, for years, little changed. Lots of different efforts were made to fix this, but it was unclear exactly which way to go. Until one year, a group of electrical engineering students in Eastern Europe got together for a Plone training. After struggling for several hours to try to accomplish what seemed to them to be the simplest of tasks, most of them gave up and walked away. However, a few switched gears and began writing the documentation for an API that they wished that Plone had. They consciously chose not to write any code, instead focusing first on defining the tasks that they thought were necessary and how exactly those tasks should be accomplished. Eventually, after a number of sprints to perfect the idea, the Plone API package was born. It provided a clear, well-documented facade for the most common actions needed by Plone developers. The new package spent several years as an add-on, growing stronger and adapting to the real-world requirements of developers. And now, in Plone 5, it's part of the core system. Plone API is a terrific example of the facade pattern in software design. It adapts the complicated APIs that are provided by the tools of the CMF and Zope into a clean and easy to use and unified API. Developers can use this without needing to worry about the mess that's going on behind the curtain. And at the same time, behind the curtain, we can begin to work on cleaning up that mess without worrying about disturbing the plugins that y'all are writing. This facade has made it possible to write plugin code that's clean, modern, and fully Pythonic. Now, the facade pattern is one example of a way of programming to an interface. An interface is a kind of a contract that specifies the external behavior of an object. Any object that exhibits this behavior can be said to provide the interface. We're all, as Pythonistas, accustomed to this idea, right? If it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, then it must be a duck, correct? Now, the benefit to such an approach to software design is that programmers don't need to worry about exactly how a job is done. They just need to worry about the inputs that it requires and the output that it will provide. They can create components that are more truly independent of each other. And in 2001, the folks at the Zorb Corporation were really interested in this idea. They'd learned the hard way about the problems of using multiple inheritance and mix-ins to build customizations. And so they started working on a new approach. They designed a component architecture for Zope. We call it the ZCA. It consisted of a Python implementation of the idea of an interface, and then a registry that's called a component manager. Programmers could create individual software components using a number of different patterns, and then register them with this component manager to be used at a later date. One of the design patterns implemented by this Zope component architecture is the adapter pattern. It's easiest to describe this pattern in terms of the real world, so let's consider an example. Most buildings that have running water, water have a hot and cold water feed. There's two pipes. One of them is hot, the other is cold. You can think of this as kind of the interface of a water supply. You can use this water supply across a number of different contexts, maybe to wash up the dirty dishes, to rinse off after a dip in your local public pool, or to do your laundry, though you might want to shoo the cat out before you begin. The sink faucet, the showers, this cat hideout, all of these are adapters of the interface that's provided by the water supply, and they make use of this hot and cold water in a variety of ways. If we want to create a bit of a code system to represent this, we might do something a little bit like this. We'll import some core packages of the ZCA and then set up an interface that describes our water supply. This represents the thing that's going to be adapted. Notice that we don't have any implementation details in here, just names for attributes and the descriptions of them for documentation purposes. The next step is to create an interface that represents our adapters. We're going to use the faucet for our sink. Again, notice that we specify both methods and attributes, but we provide no implementation details here. Once we have our interfaces in place, we can start to implement Python classes. We'll set up a house that implements our water supply interface, and we can create a kitchen sink faucet so that we can finally get to our dirty dishes. There's one important thing to notice about the sink faucet. Let's take a look at the init special method here. Notice that it takes a water supply as an argument and then sets that supply as an instance attribute. This is an example of an object-oriented programming approach that's called containment or composition. 
Often, when we reach for containment, we're dealing with a situation that's more of a has-a rather than an is-a. A, a kitchen sink is not itself a special kind of water supply, but it does have one in it. At its heart, the adapter pattern is about this idea of containment. The adapted object is contained inside the adapter, and so any of its attributes and methods can be used to fulfill the interface of that adapter, our sink, a shower, or perhaps a washing machine. Now, as it turns out, this design pattern is quite useful in a large and complex system like Plone. It's helped to solve a number of the thorny problems that we've faced in trying to deliver simple and reliable customizability. One of the ways that adapters have helped is in allowing us to treat a number of different objects as if they shared a certain attribute. For example, the ability to be published. Now, remember that one of the key features of Zope is this idea of object publication. We take an object and we display it directly as an HTTP response. If you remember, Zope uses traversal to find this object. Then the object that we find is supposed to publish itself and return a representation that can be sent back as an HTTP response. Well, what goes on under the covers there? If we dig into this mApply function, we can see that after doing some other work, it returns the result of calling the object. For content objects in the CMF, and thus in Plone, the call method uses a function called getView4 in order to find the appropriate view for that specific object. Once the right view is found, it's called in turn to produce a result, which is then returned to build the HTTP response body. Now, if we drill down a little bit further, we find that our object is supposed to provide some sort of type info. That type info is supposed to provide us with an action whose ID matches the name of the view that we want to find. Then, we're supposed to traverse on from that object to find this action by name. And that thing there is the thing that we want to return so it can be called. Now, what this means is that our objects, in order to be published, need to provide this call special method. They also have to be able to provide type info so that we can get the right action. They can get that from this mix-in class here. In addition, they have to be traversable so that once we have the name of the action, we can go on and traverse to find it. In order to get at that, we look at simple item, which inherits from item, which then in turn inherits from the traversable mix-in. So to implement the ability to publish an object, we use five separate classes. But if we count all the inherited classes, which provide other required behaviors like persistence, access control, indexing, and so on, the count of inherited classes comes to 16. <laughs> and if we follow the entire dependency tree for this extremely simple content object, we end up involving 20 separate classes. Think about all the methods on all of those classes. As it turns out, objects with a lot of responsibilities end up being big and a little bit difficult to use. And this, of course, is before we even begin to get up to the actual content types that are being used in Plone. But before you get too down on Zope for this, look carefully at your own favorite frameworks and libraries. Providing the ability to use multiple inheritance, mix-in classes, which are at the root of Pythonicity, it makes it really easy for any reasonably complex system to end up in exactly this same kind of tangle. Plone inherited this problem from the Zope and CMF layers underneath it. But at the same time, the work that Zope did in building the ZCA gave us the key to fixing it as well. After all, in a world with this idea of adapters, do we really need to have objects publish themselves directly? Remember, that call method from our basic content class? Let's take another closer look at what's going on here. At the core, we're looking up a callable that we're going to name view, and then using apply to call that thing with the content object and the request as arguments. If we simplify it, it might look a little bit like this. What if we rethink how this works? What if this thing that we're calling view is actually a callable class, one that contains the content object and the request? Now, for those of you in the audience who know other web frameworks, this should start to look a little bit familiar to you. To me, it's the start of a really simple class-based view. But Plone doesn't have URL dispatch in order to be able to look up class-based views in relation to a URL. Instead, Plone uses traversal and object publication. 
but Plone does have adapters and interfaces. So we can make a minor update to our view class. We can claim that it implements a browser view interface. Notice that this adapter adapts both the context and the request. It contains both of them. When a request comes into our site now, well, then we use traversal, just like we always have, to find the object that we're looking for. But now, instead of calling it and having it publish itself, we can look up a browser view by name that contains both that object and the request. And if we call that object, we can get back a representation that it produces using the content object and the request. The same default view can be used across different types of content. You just need to ask for it, and it appears. Or we can register different adapters for different types of content. And when we provide that content type and the request, we get back the one we want automatically. The result of this new approach is a profound change. Publishing functionality that was needed by our content objects is now delegated to the adapter. Our objects get a lot simpler. And better yet, we can now think of content objects and our view of them as separate things. And on top of it all, we get to treat anything that needs to be published in exactly the same way. Adapters have made publishing objects simpler and more easily customizable. Now, moving beyond literal adaptation, I'd like to finally consider a more metaphorical version. Here, there's not really any adaptation going on at all, but the idea helps to lead us to the solution to another thorny problem, that of theming plone. Remember that back in the beginning, the CMF gave us this idea of grouping an ordered series of folders in order to make a theme. Each of these folders would contain page templates, CSS, JavaScript, static images, things like that that you need to make your site look good. But in order to customize these themes, all you have to do is to take a new thing that has the same name and make sure that it's found in a folder that's higher up that pile than the original. This is easy to do through the web because you can always find the original item and click on this button here. This would make a copy of the thing into the custom folder, which was always the folder right at the top of the pile. This copied version gets stored in the database and could be edited through the web. Now, of course, page templates have all sorts of expectations built into them. What values are going to be present in the context when it's rendered? What names will be available for macros? Things like this. And this is where upgrades begin to bite you. If the expectations of your page templates change between versions of Plone, then on upgrade, all of these customized page templates that you've so carefully created are now broken. Worse, you can't tell that they're broken until after you've upgraded, turned your site on, and find yourself facing a pile of errors. Fixing these problems is difficult, it's slow, and it's expensive, which is like the triumvirate of horrible for people who want to build websites. Now, another hazard with this approach to theming is that manually ordering folders full of static assets is actually inherently brittle. Think about it. Even if you move your customizations out to the file system, it's possible that some other plugin that you add to your site later might override the same template, the same CSS file, in a different way. And it might put its customizations just a little bit higher up the pile than yours. Suddenly, things don't look the way that you're expecting them to. The rise of browser views that I described earlier helps to make things a little bit less hazardous, but page templates are associated with browser views, and those are fetched directly from the file system rather than out of one of these ordered layer folders. But if you use browser views and page templates associated with them, the customizations become kind of difficult to do. To theme clone now, you have to know HTML, JavaScript, CSS, Python, the Zope page template language, and XML. So some folks in the community ask themselves a fairly simple question. Why do I have to override page templates at all? We're accustomed in the web world to thinking about page templates as the layout of our visible data. Generally, in the web world, if we want to change that layout, well, then we override the templates. Consider a news item with a title, some body text, a lead image, and a contact. The default layout might look a little bit like this, but maybe you would prefer it to look like that. To do so, you override the old template with your new one. But is this really the only way that things can be? Maybe layout is just layout. What if there were a way that you could adapt a layout to magically transform one layout into another? Well, as it turns out, there is. The technology has been around for years. <laughs> 
<laughs> this leads us to Diazo. We write XSLT so you don't have to. <laughs> now, Diazo started its life as two separate packages. There was Deliverance and XDV. The code base for XDV eventually won out and became Diazo, but some of the ideas of Deliverance were adopted as well. It works with this idea of a theme and then the original content. And it consists of eight separate rules. The first one is the theme rule, which identifies a plain HTML page that's going to be used as your theme layout. This is just HTML, JavaScript, CSS. All the other rules use selectors to find a, the HTML elements in either the target theme or in the source content. The selectors that Diazo uses can be XPath selectors, if you really want them to be. Or you can use those nice, happy CSS-style selectors that are used by jQuery and pretty much every other front-end library. In addition to the theme rule, there's also rules to replace theme elements with one from the content, to insert content items either before or after theme elements, to drop elements and their children, or to skip over an element, leaving its children in place. We can also merge or copy attributes from one element to another. What Diazo does is take the rules that you write and precompile them into an XSLT file that transforms the plain HTML of a Plone site directly into the HTML of your theme. A, a theme for Plone 5, then, can consist purely of HTML layouts, CSS, and JavaScript, and then one rules file that determines where the content that Plone produces is going to be placed in the layouts that are provided. If you have a designer that you work with, they can use their own tools. If they prefer Grunt or Gulp, Yeoman, if they prefer Webpack, any of these things are no problem because all of that happens outside of the world of Plone and Python. You just add rules to whatever they give you and upload a zip file. Now, I know, everybody does, but Diazo rules Use XML syntax. And if you use Diazo with other web applications, and you can, either as a plugin to your web server or as a WSGI middleware layer, that's how you have to write them. But with Plone, you get more. And I'm going to show you. So this is a Plone site, Plone 5. <laughs> no, it's not a Plone site. This is a Plone site. It's a really good thing they have these screens right here. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do here is take a look at our beautiful Plone site uh, and know how it looks. On the back end, when we want to create a new theme, we can just upload a nice little zip file that we've pre-created for us. I'm going to use this one right down here. I hope the folks who created this in the first place will not be too upset with me for, for stealing it from them shamelessly. And when we've uploaded it, it creates for us a little rules file. This rules file is where we're going to create all of the rules that we want to create in order to uh, set up our theme. But first, before we set up our theme, we need to go back to the control panel and activate this one. So let's turn this one on. Once we've done so, we can go ahead and take a look at the front end of the website, and you'll see that when we reload it, our website looks entirely different. Notice up here these little, whoops, sorry, these little buttons that let us navigate from place to place. They don't belong to Plone at all. They're completely separate from the Plone website behind us. What we're going to do is we're going to create a little rule that allows us to replace those things using elements from our Plone site. So we're going to set up a rule that allows us to replace things in one from, with things from the other. And we're going to click on this little build rule here, and it's going to let us come down and hover over the elements we want. We can move up until we've selected all of the buttons that we want to replace and hit Enter in order to select them. And then it offers us the opportunity to find the corresponding element within the Plone theme that we want to use. So we'll hover over that. We'll hit Enter a couple times until we get up here, select those, and then finally, because we don't want to just replace one list with the other, there might be some styling or other things going on that we want to preserve, we'll go ahead and apply this rule only to the children of the list. We insert this rule, which promptly goes into the wrong place because I selected the wrong chunk. I'll get rid of it here, come back down where it's supposed to have been in the first place. We will press the little Save button. Oops, sorry, here's the little Save button. And then, when we go back to the front end, 
whoops, to take a look at our website, watch those buttons up at the top, we now have Plones buttons showing up. We can also do the same thing with the body content for this, uh, but since we're running a little bit low on time here, I'm going to go ahead and skip past that and move back to the end of the presentation. As you can see, Diazo helps making theming Plone 5 into a very easy and simple proposition. The idea of adaptation helped lead Plone developers to this new idea, and it's helped to improve the story of customizing Plone themes. Adaptation overall has provided a very powerful metaphor for, many of the, for solving many of the challenges that Plone has faced over time. And we inherited this idea from the work that Zope did on the Zope component architecture. Other systems have also taken those ideas even farther. Over on another branch of our evolutionary tree, Pyramid has used the power of the ZCA to build a phenomenally customizable system that's remarkably easy to work with. I urge you to take a look at it and try it out. But this idea of adaptation isn't limited only to web systems. You can use these powerful concepts in your software as well. The approach allows you to adapt fluidly to changing needs over time. And the world of the web continues to change. RESTful APIs are replacing server-bound systems. Client-side apps are becoming the norm. The headless CMS appears to be on the horizon. It's an idea whose time has come. But powered by adaptation, Plone will continue to be a vital part of this future. And we'd love it if you would join us there. Hey, give me the mic back. One last little thing before everybody takes off. Um, if you are a member of the Zope family or the Plone family, if you've ever used one of these tools, we'd love it if you would come up after the talk is over here so that you can uh, take a family picture with us. All right, thanks. It is time for us to head to the Expo Hall for posters and the job fair. Let's give a last round of applause to all of our speakers this morning. Thank you.